Let's pray. Lord, this is where we're supposed to be, in your house. God, this is where we're supposed to be, in your presence, with you. And Lord, help us as we study, as we learn. Lord, as we dig in to this passage. And Lord, glean from it. Taking just the deep and the rich things and applying them to our lives and to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So last time we were in this passage, we talked very specifically about the issue of patience. The idea of being patiently waiting because the Lord is coming. And because the Lord is coming, and he says, even standing at the door. So it's like the Lord is in, the, it's almost like he's coming right through the door right now. And so we, are, we need to be waiting because the Lord is coming. And as we're waiting, we need to be patient now, how many of you ever discovered that being patient can be difficult? Anybody ever notice that? Like waiting and being patient can be hard. In fact, most people will not pray for patience because the moment you pray for patience, God gives you an opportunity to be patient. Do you know what I mean? So it was, it's been fun for me to be in a different community with my children um, who lived in an area that they never had to really stand in line. I'm sorry, you know, the biggest blockbuster in the country would come out, would come to the theater in a town of 3,000 people. If you had two people in front of you, that was busy. You, they, just, they weren't used to standing in line. And then we came here. And all of a sudden, we're standing in line. And they're having to learn to be patient. You know, I remember one time I said, Lord, give me patience with my wife. Oh, I regretted that prayer. <laughs> because what happened is God gave me an opportunity to be patient with her. And God always gives me an opportunity to be patient. But as we're waiting, as we're being patient, as we're looking for the Lord's coming, in verse 9 in chapter 5 of James, it says this, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And that's that whole thing. He's like, as if he's about to walk into the room. Jesus is about to come. He says in verse 10, he says, My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord was very compassionate and merciful. So kind of as a recap, remember that first part? It's, and this is the, the, the title of the message is, is Living While We Wait. And living while we wait, the first part we looked at last week was patience. We need to be patient and not grumbling and not complaining to one another. But now we're going to talk about the second part of, of uh, living while we wait, which is persistence. It's perseverance. It's not giving up. How many of you in your Christian walk have ever gotten to the place where like, that's it, I'm done, throwing in the towel. Right? But there's like six of us in the room that are honest. Right. The rest of you, a bunch of liars. Um, but the, the issues, like we, we all have those issues, right? We have those difficult things. And so let's go ahead and let's start in verse 10. Because as we came out of verse 9, he says, Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And he says, My brethren, speaking to the family again, he says, Take the prophets. So the idea of taking the prophets, he says, Hey, look at their example. He says, Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. And we need to remember this. We need to remember that the prophets in the Old Testament spoke of the Lord. They spoke for the Lord. For, uh, 2 Peter 1.21 says this, For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So he says, take the prophets, the men who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, take them as an example. Think about their ministry, their calling, and think about how they suffered. And it says, and it goes on, it says, as an example of suffering and patience. Now, the word here for example um, is an interesting Greek word. It, it's talking about an example that is for moral instruction. Podigma is the Greek word. And what that word means, it says, hey, look, this is an example of a behavior, but it's an example of a behavior that we're going to use for moral instruction. 
So what he's saying, he says, I want you to consider the example of holy men of God that spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and I want you to consider how God used them as a moral instruction for us to line up our behavior in the way that they did as they served the Lord. Now the idea of suffering, this is, this is really interesting. It's the only place in the New Testament where this word is used. And uh, kakopathia, it's an interesting word because it does not necessarily mean endurance of affliction. It actually speaks of the affliction itself. So it's not saying, hey, it's, it's not saying, hey, you know what, we're going to go ahead and we're going to endure this affliction. He's, 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 he's saying this is, we're talking about the, inf- the affliction itself. Suffering and patience in our context would be better understood patience in the face of of adversity, how many of you understand having to be patient in the face of adversity? That's it. You know what? We're going to have adversity. We're going to have difficulties. Remember how he started the book? He said, count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces, what's the word? Patience. And he says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, lacking nothing. So allow that trial to work out in you patience. And then he comes kind of full circle. He says, hey, I want you to remember these men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit as a moral example of how we are to be patient in the face of adversity. So many people want to serve the Lord. There are so many people out there, I want to serve the Lord. I want to be in ministry. Sometimes they want to be in ministry for the wrong reason. Sometimes like, I want to be in ministry because I, I want a job where I can just come and sit and read and I don't have to do nothing for a living. <laughs> it's kind of their attitude. We had, there was a young man years ago that he, got, he had a work release program from school. He says, I'm going to be a youth pastor, and I'm, I've worked it out. I'm going to come over, and I'm going to shadow you, and I'm going to become a pastor before I get out of high school. I'm like, yeah, no, you're not, but come on over. And he came over, and he said, okay, I'm going to do everything that you do. I said, oh, this ought to be fun. The first two days he was there, we cleaned bathrooms. For two days, we cleaned bathrooms. We had some children that... Uh, didn't use the bathrooms correctly. And it took us two days to clean all the bathrooms. We had 11 bathrooms in the building. Huge stalls bathrooms. And we went through and we had to clean them. He said, okay, well, when are we going to do ministry? What, what are we going to do next? I said, well, come back tomorrow. He came back the next day. You know what we did the next day? We vacuumed and straightened chairs. 20 minutes before the service, after working an eight-hour day, I went ahead and I put the worship together. And I got up and I led the worship team. He couldn't help with that, but he sat there the whole time I did that. He says, well, when are we going to do ministry? The next day he came back. And I went and I sat with somebody who was dying with, of cancer. I sat and I prayed and I cried with them. And he goes, no, seriously, when are we going to do ministry? And I said, what do you think ministry is? He says, well, ministry is me in the front telling the people what's up. And I said, ministry is washing the feet of God's people. I said, ministry is serving when it's hard. Ministry is giving of yourself. Ministry is getting on your knees and loving people when they, can, they feel unlovable and they feel untouchable. That's what ministry is. Ministry is becoming the servant of people. It is about making yourself the lowest and loving them. And it was amazing to me to see how he wanted to serve as long as he was comfortable. Because remember when I was there praying for that family who's losing a loved one to cancer? He couldn't stay in the house. He had to go outside because he couldn't handle it. I said, that's ministry. That's doing things when you're uncomfortable. Doing things that are not easy to do. And and in this life, guys, we're going to suffer in this life. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 through 15 says this, Yes, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things that you have learned, been assured of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith that is in Jesus Christ. And now James goes on, he says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. He says, look, it's a truth. 
It is absolutely a truth that we count them blessed who are endured. Um, Macarizo, this is a word for blessed. It means they were fortunate. We counted them and considered them to be happy, to be blessed. We considered them favored as they showed endurance in the face of the things that the world would come. And that word for endure, this is an important word because there are two different words in this passage. This, we've talked about patience. Now we're going to talk about endurance. Hypomeno is the Greek word. And it, it talks about waiting or endurance, hanging in there. But it, it is to maintain a course of action and doing so in the face of opposition. In other words, you're going to go this way and people are going to try and get you not to go that way. But you keep going that way because you know that's the way you're supposed to go. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Anyone here? If we're going to serve the Lord, if we're going to love the Lord, and you know, especially our young people, if we get our young people, our teenagers, our college students, if we get them to understand this principle, that when we are called by God, we are called to set our face to follow Him, and the world's going to do everything it can do to get us off track, to push us away, and to oppose us as we're going towards that goal. This is the endurance that He's talking about. He says, man, the Lord is coming. Don't grumble. Be patient. Look for the coming of the Lord. And you know what? Have some hypomeno. Have some endurance. Keep going in the direction you're supposed to go. You know, another way you could say this is to stand your ground. Hold out. Don't give in. Have you ever noticed young people give in after a while? That peer pressure comes and it just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. It's been fun for me to watch my children grow up and fight that good fight. You know, I have had my children, well, everybody else is going. I'm like, you're not. Something about the movie theater and salmon, they don't check IDs. You can go to, you can be 10 years old and go to a rated R movie. They wouldn't, they wouldn't check. You know, my my sons would be like, well, everybody else is going to the movie. I said, but you're not. Set your face towards heaven, son. And all of us, we need to set our face towards heaven. Because remember, in the context, look, the Lord's coming. Let's set our face towards heaven. Let's keep going. But it is to be patient in the face of adversity. And we have adversity in this life. And so what do we do? What do we do when we are faced with adversity? Um, Show of hands, how many of you have ever faced adversity because of your Christian walk? Not because you're being stupid, but because of your Christian walk. You all know the difference, right? We can face adversity because we're being dumb, and then we can face adversity because of our witness or our walk. So what do we do? Do we quit? Do we throw in the towel and say, that's it, no more, I don't, I don't need it? Most of us can endure and keep going the path when it's easy, but then when the heat is on and it gets hard, what happens? A lot of times we run. We, we run, we see people run away all the time. What would it be like if everyone who ever stepped in foot set foot inside the church was still following the Lord. Could you imagine how many people would be in the church? But people come, and then it gets hard. And of course, there's the parable of the, the sower and the seeds that we could talk about. But, you know, no one enjoys suffering. We just don't. Anybody enjoy suffering? Okay, just wanted to check, because every once in a while, there's some really guy in the back going, oh, I don't mind. <laughs> but, uh, but no, none of us like it. But suffering, the difficulties, the adversaries that come against us for our faith... It's part of the normal Christian life. I want to share this with you. This is something that's important. See, as a teacher, you give the lesson and then the test. How many of you are familiar with that protocol? You give the lesson, then there's the test. Life is not like that. Life gives you the test, then you get the lesson. How many of you can say amen to that? Amen, Amen, right? We get the test, then we get the lesson. And this is very much so for us in our Christian walk. And so we will suffer as we go out and serve the Lord as a result of our testimony, as a result of being deliberate about our faith as a result of choosing to live a godly life, as a result to stand for truth that opposes the world, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we do? I'm gonna share with you just a few things that you can write down in your notes. What do we do? How do we keep going? How do we endure? Here's the first thing. Don't forget God in your suffering. 
See, a lot of times we just start looking at our suffering. We go, it's so hard. And we look at our suffering and we don't look at God anymore. God is bigger than our suffering. God is bigger than what we are facing. God is bigger than anything that will come against us. God is bigger. So do not forget God in your suffering. Remember your purpose. Remember to whom you serve. You have a purpose. God has designed you for his purpose, to bring glory to his name. Don't forget your purpose when you're suffering. And then also, remember whom you serve. Here's the second thing. Remember to whom you belong. You belong to Christ. Remember that. Remember God in your suffering, but remember to whom you belong. You belong to Jesus. You have been bought and paid for with the great price, the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember that you belong to Christ. You do not belong to your circumstance, and you do not belong to other people. That's slavery. You belong to Christ. We do not belong to other people. We do not belong to a circumstance or a trial or a difficulty. We do not belong to a disease. We belong to Christ. And here's the third thing to remember is this. Remember that you remember what you know to be true in God's word. Remember God's word. Remember God's word. So don't... I heard this quote. I'll see if I can remember it. Don't doubt in the dark what you've seen in the light. Remember God's word. Remember what you know is true. And do not doubt in the dark what you know in the light, what you've seen in the light. Here's the fourth thing. Remember that God has called you to keep going. God hasn't told you to quit. And I'll I'll be honest with you, there are days when you're serving the Lord when perseverance is necessary. I was telling the worship team when we were in the back having some uh, meal together that I just shared with them. I said, you know, (laughs) I now know why my day has been the way it's been because of the message that I'm sharing tonight. Because this was a, hey, throw in the towel, quit. There was resistance all day long. And I was telling somebody, look, if there's resistance, that at least means I'm going in the right direction. Because if there's resistance, that means I'm going towards Christ and everything around me doesn't want me to go towards Christ. And I'm going to keep going towards Christ. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give in. We need to persevere. We need to stay the course. We need to be faithful regardless of the opposition, regardless of the hardship. He says to have the hypomeno, the endurance, because those who endured were fortunate and they were blessed because they endured. Here's the fifth thing. And this one's important. Trust God to be your defender and trust God to be your deliverer. God's our deliverer. God's our defender and let him do that and don't take matters into your own hands. That's when we lose, that's when we lose course. We start getting off, you know, and the next thing is that in, the, in that context, don't become bitter or argumentative. And he goes on now in verse 11 and he says, you have heard of the perseverance of Job. He uses Job as an example. And of course, they would have all been familiar with Job. He says, and had seen the end intended by the Lord. Job was honored, but he persevered in the multi, and, you know, and he had lots of blessings and then he lost them all. You know, something really interesting about this is see, Marco Cathemo, that, that word that we talked about that is the word for patience, he never said that Job had patience. He said that Job had the hypomeno. He said that Job had the perseverance. He hung in there, even when it was difficult. Remember, we looked at that, knowing the testing of your faith produces patience at the beginning of James. You know, in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 11, it says, it says that we are strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. We can have patience and long suffering with joy. And of course, as we do that, verse 12 says, and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. I mean, Job Job endured, he endured. He he was steadfast, though he at times was impatient with God. How many of you have read the book of Job, right? Book of Job is interesting because Job gets a little whiny, doesn't he? Do you guys notice Job getting a little whiny when you read it? He does. He gets a little whiny. He gets a little, he gets impatient. And so, We need to remember that we can trust God with the outcome. Why can we trust God with the outcome? Because God is compassionate. God is merciful. James kind of sums that all up there. Hey, if you're struggling right now, if you're suffering, if you're going through something difficult, remember the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. 
Job was a wealthy man and he lost everything. He lost it all. He lost everything except his wife and the servants that came and told him that all of his stuff was gone, destroyed, dead. Of course, they didn't stick around, I'm pretty sure, because they're like, well, this is definitely an uh, opportunity to change employers because I can't work for a guy who doesn't have anything. And so, but when you read the last chapter of the book in verse 42, 12, it says this in Job. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than the beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, which is 2,000 oxen, and 1,000 female donkey. I mean, God just blessed him. He just poured out on him. He lost it all. He lost everything, and then God restored it. Even his family was replenished. Why? Because Job was patient. He endured. You ever felt like not enduring? You ever felt like giving up? It's easy. Just you feel like, I, just, I don't want to go anymore. I'm tired. He had periods where he doubted and he questioned God, but he's an example of a man who endured difficulties. And he was rewarded greatly. So too for us, when we wait upon the Lord, our strength is renewed, according to Isaiah, and we're patient. We know the Lord is coming, and we just hang in there. We endure. We're going to set our face towards the goal. We're not going to get all distracted by all these other things. And so verse 12, we'll close with this. In verse 12, he says, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, just in case you maybe had another one in mind. No other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. So James kind of concludes this. Hey, we understand that the Lord is coming, so be patient. Don't grumble with each other, and have some endurance that you might be blessed. And don't swear an oath. In other words, do not take an empty oath. Living with persistence, living with patience, we have no reason to swear an oath. Why? Well, because we're trusting in the Lord, but also that we should be trusted with our word. Church, did you know that we should be trustable people? Do you realize how many times the Bible warns about liars and where liars end up? What's the one sin we can always talk about that we're always guilty of? What is it? Lying. Hey, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Let's not get caught up in those things. Let's make sure that we speak truth from our lips. Swear here, by the way, does not refer to profanity but to taking an oath. Just so you know, there's other verses that deal with uh, profane language from our mouths, but this isn't one of them. And then it says, and the testimony for us as believers should be that when we say yes, it means yes. And when we say no, that's what we mean. So how many of you have ever told somebody yes, and then, but it was actually a no? How many of you have ever done it because you just wanted to make somebody happy and ended up not making them happy? Just tell them no up front, okay? That's one of the things that, you know, right now there's a lot going on in my life. There's a lot happening as far as my, I'm trying to get a home ready to sell in another community. It's a three-hour drive away. We're trying to get that done. I'm trying to take care of the ministry here, take care of my family there, take care of my children, whom I only see two evenings a week when I'm traveling. I see my boys, and it's killing me right now. I'm just being totally honest, transparent with you. I see my boys a total of about eight hours in a week. And that's it. And as a father of teenage boys, that's making me crazy. It's making them a little crazy too. I had some interesting texts from my boys today. Um, it's interesting when a teenage boy sends you a text, says, hey, praying for you, miss you. Yeah, there's a lot more in that, right? You go, that's a teenage boy who just sent that. Yeah, obviously he needs his dad around, right? And so we're, we're going through that. So I can't say yes to everything. But how many of you guys understand, you all can't say yes to everything, can you? But when we try and please people, be men pleasers, don't we say yes to people all the time? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Yes, I can do that. Yes, I'll do that. You know, the Bible tells us, hey, be careful that, you know, <laughs> it, you know, it's better to do something to your own hurt than to not keep your word. So the idea is, man, so often, man, we need to be careful. If we can't do it, let's say no. And by the way, do me a favor. When somebody asks you, hey, can you do it? And you know the answer is no. Don't say you'll pray about it. 
I'm just sharing that with you. Don't be like, I'll pray about that. If you already know the answer is no, just go, no. Don't be rude. Don't be like, no. Don't, don't be like that. But just, but just be honest. If, if, it's, if it's not, you know, if you know that's no, if the Lord hasn't called you in that direction or something, just, tell, just, say, just say no. It's okay. But boy, I tell you what, you know, think about those people that we invite to church, right? Hey, man, you want to come to church with me? Yeah, I'll come to church with you. Do they ever come to church? No. I want to encourage you. If somebody says, yes, they're going to come to church with you, you say, what time do you want me to pick you up? And you bring them. And if they're like, oh, I'll meet you there. Go, no, it's cool. You know, our pastor said we got to bring you. No, no. But, uh, but, you know, you go and you actually bring them. Because, you know what, a lot of times they're going to go, oh, you know, I said yes, but I really wasn't. No. And, and so he says, look, let your yes be yes, your no be no. It's really straightforward. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33, says this. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. And Jesus says, but I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black or grow. <laughs> um, I don't know why he didn't put that in there. But uh, verse 37, but he says, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For, what, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. My dad told me something one time. He says, he says, the only thing you actually ever possess in this world is your time. It's the only true possession you ever have. If you think about it, son, you go and you give your time, you get paid for your time. Yes, you're working during that time, but you get paid for it. And you're giving of your time and your energy. And so our time is something that we truly possess. But there's another thing that's really important. We possess our word. Our word. Remember one time I said to my, I told my dad, I'll take out the trash, and I didn't take out the trash. He said, son, your word doesn't mean anything. It was not backed up by action. So if you say you're going to do it, you do it, or tell me you're not going to do it. You know, how often do we have a yes, not mean yes, even in our worship? God, I hear the message. God, I hear that I need to repent. Lord, I need to stop sleeping with my girlfriend because we ain't married. I know that. I'm, I need to stop. Yes, Lord, I will stop. And then we go and we do it anyway. How often are we lying to the Lord? How often is our yes not yes with the Lord? I mean, we're talking about yes, yes and no to no, 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 no. <laughs> more coffee. We're talking about our, our, you know, our, our yes being yes and our no being no towards one another. But how much more do we lie to God? Do we not have a yes relationship with God? Where God, if your word says it, I will respond with yes because it's a command and I'm going to honor and obey you and I will respond with yes because he says anything other than yes be yes and no be no is from the evil one. And remember, he says, look, he's, in the context, he says, look, the judge is standing at the door. Jesus, it's like the Lord's about to walk in on the scene and let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be honest. Be trustworthy. He says, lest you be condemned or fall into judgment. How many of you ever said, told somebody you'd do something, didn't do it, and found yourself in a world of hurt, right? That's what James is saying. We need to be patient because the Lord is coming. We need to persevere and go forward and not go to the left or the right. Keep going because the Lord is coming. And because the Lord is coming, we don't have time to mess around. So let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you say you're going to do it, do it. If you know you can't do it, don't tell them you will do it. Just say, no, I can't. And by the way, I'm going to be honest with you, that's very hard for me. I've been working with people a long time. As I work with people, people want things. As a pastor, it's my job to help them. And so, hey, pastor, could you do this? Like, yeah, let me pray about it. And I actually would go pray about it. But a lot of times I'd know right then, I'd go, man, I'm not supposed to do that right now. I've had five people ask me to do weddings the week that I'm supposed to move my family here for this summer already. And I'm like, and, and you know what's interesting? It's not anybody in our body. These are people that are outside of this body. And I'm like, 
Lord, I need some wisdom right now. Because it's like everything just keeps taking more and more time. And what happens if you say yes so much and then you stretch yourself so thin that you're no good to anybody because you stretch yourself out because you keep saying yes because you don't realize it's okay. It doesn't say, let your yes be yes and let all your yeses be yes. It says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Did you know the Bible says it's okay to say no? The magic word is no. It's okay to say that. And I think it's important. But if we say it, we need to know that we need to say it. Um, there was a man who was so determined to learn this lesson that once a week, over 40 years, he took one day to fast from talking. <laughs> there was another, uh, I read a story one time of a, of a monk who carried a pebble in his mouth to keep him from speaking. And so I read that. I went, oh, that's a great idea. So I went out to the parking lot and found a pebble. And I came inside and I washed it like 30 times. And I just put it on, the, on my tongue. And I did that for about two days. And then we had a, I had a staff meeting. And I still had this, I'm still carrying this thing around. And it was interesting because you don't realize how much you talk. Because every time you have to talk, you have to take this thing out. We talk too much. You guys know that? Have you ever noticed that? We talk too much. And we don't listen enough. Because what did James say earlier? He said, be slow to speak. Quick to hear, right? Be quick to listen. I always tell my boys, you've got one mouth, two ears. You should listen twice as much as you talk. And they said, why? I said, because one day you'll be married and you'll need to do that anyway. <laughs> they now understand that because they watch my wife's and my relationship. They understand, oh, that's it. Dad listens. And that's part of how he loves mom. And, and, but we, we, sometimes we talk too much. It's okay, let your yes be yes, your no be no. It's church is something we need to realize. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19 says this, in the multitudes of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. The more we talk, the more trouble we get into. And James is very practically saying, hey, we keep our speech simple, keep it straightforward, be patient, endure, don't let something push you off track. You know where the goal is. You know where you're supposed to be going. So with that, guys, let's stand. We're going to pray, and we're going to close and worship together. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And Lord, I do pray that we'd be men and women who would be patient, and we would be men and women who would endure as we serve you as we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.